Welcome to the Brian Buffini Show, where we explore the mindsets, motivation, and methodologies of success. Every year at Buffini & Company, we put on an elite event called the Peak Experience that focuses in on personal and professional growth. An anchor principle always taught and practiced is goal setting. And in today's show, we hear Joe Nigo, Brian's longtime friend and America's number one listing agent, teach a goal setting process that will help you clear out obstacles, keep you consistent, and significantly improve your rate of achievement. Let's listen in. Have you ever set a goal and not achieve it? Yes or no? How many of you have set the go same goal more than once? More than twice? More than five times? Yeah. I know it's tough. Because uh, many times, you go through a goal writing session, even myself, it's kind of like blowing up an empty paper bag. And you're here in an environment where it's just awesome. Soft playing music, right? You got supportive people around. You're oozing with motivation and you're just full of hope. And you're pouring all your energy into your goal. And you're just sitting here and going, well, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, sell more homes. And it's like, <laughs> I'm going to get healthy and, and exercise and eat right. And <laughs> I'm going to hire an assistant. And you have all your hopes and dreams. And then reality sets in. And what happens is the goals you wrote are like an empty paper bag. And you go back and the people back at the office aren't as supportive as the people here. <laughs> the music, is an ins it's a little bit too loud, right? And then the hope and the motivation you once have kind of get thrown into the trash can only to be resurrected again at the next event. And then you're at the next event, and Brian's got you pumped up. You're at the BBST, and you're, I'm going to list more homes. I'm going to sell. I'm going to do calls, notes, Popeyes. And then it happens again. And it's the same old, same old, over again. And the goals go by the wayside. Has that ever happened to you, yes or no? It happens to all of us. Uh, and here's what I want to make. This goal writing session will be the best session that you've ever participated in. It will be without a doubt because, because we are just not only setting goals, and we've done that in the past and with constraints, we haven't had a chance to share the whole process with you. But today, we're going to talk about redeeming your golden ticket. Because what good is the ticket if you don't redeem it? Do you guys agree? And I'm going to give you seven phases of achieving goals. And I'll just give you a little review right here. It's not in your workbook. But get ready to get in your workbook because we're going to get after it. I'll give you the seven phases. And the first phase of redeeming a golden ticket is really understanding and be able to identify. Just be able to identify what you truly want and how it aligns with you. Number two, we're going to talk about the connection phase. Writing it is one thing, embedding it and connecting it into the fabric of who you are is a whole nother. And then we're going to talk about how to plan. One of the most undervalued skills in all of life. I'm going to show you what I did and how, how you could do the same. And then we're going to talk about being bold. How do you be bold without being rude? I'm going to give you exactly how to do it. Number five, I'm going to teach you a principle that every successful person uses. It's called the clear-out principle. And I'll give you some examples. You'll be using this principle each and every day moving forward. I'm going to talk about feedback. How feedback is so vital that if you don't have daily mechanisms in place as far as feedback, as far as letting you know if you're getting closer to or further from your goal, if you don't have that in place, it'll be an empty paper bag experience. And then we're going to talk about the process. It's about the whole process, the ups and the down process, and how you have to trust the process. I'm going to cover all seven of those. All right? Now, this is what happens. I've, I, I don't take this stage for granted at all. You know, Brian, entrust me to be with you. I, I do not take that for granted. I put a tremendous amount of time and energy into helping you get closer to redeeming your golden ticket. 
And I asked him, I said, I got these resources and tools that I use in my own business. Can we ask the team to you know, use their talents so we could take these seven phases, put it in a, a tangible tool workbook format, and can we do that where we could get one to each and every member? And of course, he said, no doubt, let's do it. Because once a goal is set, it needs to be led. <laughs> you thought Brian was the only talented one, did you? It needs to be led. All right, so in this process of redeeming your golden ticket, it's real important to use a pencil, and there's an eraser here. And what do you think the eraser is for? When you make a mistake or you make something you don't want to write, you use the eraser. It's kind of your get out of jail free card. So you just, we're going to be using, we'll be using both today. All right? So here's what happens. Brian and I were in Richmond, Virginia, BBST. A woman pops her hand up, has a question. She asked the question. She said, I've been in coaching a long time. I've been in real estate a long time. Here's the truth of the matter. I'm tired of chasing goals. It's just another thing on my to-do list. It creates a lot of discontent. It requires a lot of energy. It's emotionally draining. She said, I'm tired of doing that. What's your take on it? And I responded. I said, your goals are written and created for you, not you for your goals. Your goals should serve you, not you serve your goals. And I gave her this advice you want to write down in your workbook. Write this down in your workbook, not in your golden resource, but write it down in your workbook. Write this down in your workbook. I gave her this advice. I said, your goals should be elusive. This is something that's been a little bit hard for you to get. They should be personal, something that's important to you, and they should be life-enhancing. You've got to make your life better. Isn't that what this is all about? is about putting in the work, learning, growing, so it enhances our life. Your goals shouldn't be just a trophy that you could put up on the shelf. It's not something that I have to conquer. It should be life-enhancing. That's why we go through this process, and as you set a goal today, I want you to think about that. I want your goal to be life-enhancing as we move through here. Because we're going to be talking about redeeming your golden ticket. And let's first learn what the word redeem means. Redeem means, you can write this down, is to gain possession in exchange for payment. In exchange for payment. So it's gain possession in exchange for payment. So you're going to redeem your golden ticket. There, there's an, a, there is an action step in the title that says there's going to be payment that needs to be made. And payments aren't at all new to us. I mean, we make a car payment, we make a house payment, and hopefully, hopefully we make an income tax payment, right? So you make these payments. Redeeming your golden ticket is going to require, you can write this down, an installment payment, a payment that may need to be made every day, every week, every month. Just write that on the side, an installment payment. Next is ticket. What's a ticket? It's a piece of paper that gives the holder a certain right. It just gives you a certain right. So as we go through this today, and you use the golden resource, and we go through all seven phases of this, you're going to have a, a golden ticket that gives you the right. And the seven steps will be the payment that's required to get you closer to your goal and to accomplish that. Does that sound good? So I'm going to give you all seven steps here. I'm going, to give you a, I'm going to start with the first one right here. Are you ready? If you're ready, say I'm ready. Yes. All right, let, let's dive in here. Let's dive in here. Are you ready? Here we go. Step phase number one, phase number one in your workbook. Just go in your workbook, not in the golden resource. Phase number one is clearly identify the goal. you got to clearly identify the goal. Now, how do you do that? you got to be specific and detailed. The goal should be achievable and relevant, and it has to be, this is big, it has to be consistent with your values. It has to be consistent with your values. 
so specific and detailed, achievable and relevant, and consistent with your values. And therein lies, I feel, most of the frustration and discontent, discontent in, in goal writing and goal setting is that many of us sit down to write a goal, and what do we think? If you're like me, this is how I think. I sit, sit in your seat. Here, what, what do I think? I'm going to write down, and it's got to be more. My goal's got to be more home sold, more money made, and it's all about more, more, more. Ever, that, you ever have that thought? <laughs> or it's got to be big. It's either go big or go home. Right, it's got to be a big goal. Make a million dollars. i got to climb a mountain, run a marathon. You ever fall prey to that? Or it's a goal that you go, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what I should write here. Uh, what should I write? Oh, I should do this and I should do that. I should, should, should. And we're shooting all over ourselves. <laughs> is, is that true? And just so you know, I've, I've fallen prey to all three. And for me, it became an empty paper bag experience. And it's like, no. And just recently, not too long ago, I, I had one where I was actually on uh, the phone with Brian. We were talking. Uh, How you doing, Brian? He goes, well, I just got off the uh, Skype with my parents and, uh, in, in, back in Ireland. I go, how are they doing? And he goes, ah, to be honest with you, they're starting to slow down a bit. And I was thinking about that, and I said, well, why don't we go out and visit them? And he goes, you'd want to go? And I go, I'd love to. I haven't had, got a chance to spend a whole bunch of time with your mom or your dad, but let's go there specifically just to visit them. And uh, he goes, okay, let's do it. So I said, why don't we do this? Why don't you fly into Chicago? There's a direct flight right from O'Hare to uh, Dublin Airport. We get, leave 9, get in 9, 10.30 the next morning. He goes, well, I, I would like to take the private jet. <laughs> and I said, Brian, I am tired of arguing with you. <laughs> when you stop by, we'll, we'll do it your way again. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. This is in October, and, I, and you got to realize this. The, the jet came into Midway Airport. This is one of my favorite pictures of the city of Chicago and Brian's jet. This is an October evening, and I'm looking there. Now, you got to realize this. This is Midway Airport, smack dab right in the middle of my marketplace. That day, Oprah actually had her airplane there as well, and we were about to board this jet, and it had Buffini and Company's logo on the tail of the jet, and you know what I was thinking to myself? It would be awful nice if I had one of those too. <laughs> I'd put Nego Real Estate's logos right on the tail. It would be awesome. I could keep it right at Midway Airport. It wouldn't be far to go. And then we get in the jet, we take off, we do a layover in Canada, uh, stay overnight. The next day we work our way to Dublin, but we have to refuel in Greenland. Now, have any of you ever been to Greenland? Me neither. I didn't know any. I couldn't tell you where it was on a map. But it's this massive, it's not green, it's all white from ice and snow. It's kind of a misnomer. And we're flying, going towards uh, Greenland, and we get swallowed up into this fjord. And this fjord right here, a fjord is uh, uh, it's the North Atlantic Sea Inlet going to an airport, but you're coming through mountains. It was kind of like the scene out of Star Wars where the plane was dipping and, you know, the pod races. You know, we're going back and forth and I'm thinking to myself, isn't this awesome? There are very few people in their entire lives would ever get a chance to experience that. Icebergs floating below. And I'm thinking, isn't this a great way to experience life? I, I should have a jet of my own. <laughs> What's wrong with me? And then we keep on going. We see this ice flow, the frozen river that kind of spits out... Um, icebergs, and the whole time I'm going, man, my kids and my wife would enjoy this. I should have one of these. And then we get around the corner of this big hilly mountain thing. We turn and we catch this view right here. And I look at that and ask Brian, what is that? I said, it looks like a freshly shoveled sidewalk on the south side of Chicago. He said, that's the landing strip. And I said, Jesus, Mary and St. Joseph, are you kidding me? He goes, I, I don't remember it being that small last time I came. Well, we land, we get out, surrounded by mountains. The air was fresh. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I said, now I'm living. I, I, I need to get myself one of these jets. You know what I'm saying? 
And then we refuel, we head out to Ireland. And, and my mother's maiden name is Quinn. My, my ancestry is from the county of Mayo. And I've always denied my Irishness for some reason. My dad's Polish. So I'm dry, flying over Ireland, and I reconnect with my Irishness when I see this scene right here. The quilted fields of Ireland. This is the county Mayo. My mother's grandfather worked these fields. And I was thinking, well, how much of life am I missing out on? If I only had a jet. <laughs> well, lo and behold, we wind up finishing up that trip, going hanging out with uh, Therese and George. Uh, and I've kind of had those thoughts, but I kinda, those, they kind of dissipated. A year later, Brian, Brian flies into Chicago. We're working on a book. We spend three long days, 12-hour days working on the book. We're going. It's intense. Uh, you know, we're going through this. At the end of the three days, right when we're about to wrap everything up, Brian says, before we wrap this up, Let's set a goal. Let's set a goal that'll stretch us. Let's set a goal that'll bring out the best in us. Let's set a goal that would that really force us to be focused. And we're going, I was like, Brian, how about a what if we sold a hundred thousand books? Would that do it? He's like, no, 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 it's, got, it's a little, little bigger than that. Let's just challenge ourselves. And I go, what, what about a half a million books? Would that get it? Oh, he's saying, no, I'm not talking. What, what do you want? What, what do you want? What would make you? And I go, I, I, I want a jet just like you. <laughs> I want Nego real estate on the tail of that jet just like you. And he goes, oh, well, okay, write it up. And I write up on the board. Well, here's what happens. Time goes by. I work hard. I, I've never really, I haven't shared this with anybody, but I'm doing it here because it's a special event. But I wound up getting my own jet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to take a closer look? Yes. There you go, right there. <laughs> there you go. I'll let you borrow it anytime you want. But he, here's the truth of the matter, and he, here's the point I want to make. Can I afford a jet? I can afford a jet. I have to make some sacrifices. i got a big equity position in my home that I need to tap into. I need to liquidate some of the buildings I have. I need to cash in my retirement account. And maybe put one of the kids up for sale. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, I can make that happen. But what be, would be the collateral damage as a result of me achieving that goal? Have you ever done something like that? where you set out a goal that doesn't totally align with your own values? Has that ever happened? And I'll tell you, life has a way of kind of beating you up, sobering you up, getting you closer to your values. I, I love this quote right here. It says, if you don't make time to work on creating the life you want, you're going to spend a lot of time dealing with the life you don't want. Isn't that true? Now, this guy's name is Kevin No. He, I think we'd all agree he's like an I and an E short of greatness. But I, I'm sure, give him some time. But he, he, here it is. We've all set goals that don't align with who we are. We've all set a goal for more and bigger. And that's probably not, might not be totally important to us. So what happens is we get here and we... This is what I... And then all of a sudden... Your values will always win out. Your own values run out. And then that goal that you, now it's like, oh, I, I never hit my goal. I do it over and over again. I'm not, it's like, no. I, I want you to think as we go through the phases today, what goal really aligns with who you are? What life experiences have impacted you? And I think the older I get, the more mature I get. And I've had an experience where, um, and you guys, many of know, you know, I, my, my uh, father had passed away when I was uh, 22 years old. I was caught between a boy and a man, and I, I thought my dad walked on water, you know, and uh, so here's a picture of my dad right here, me and him. This is our last picture together, and Brian talks about, we talk about pebbles on the pond and the ripples. His, he was the guy, my dad was the one who coined the phrase, it's a good life. Yeah, and he was, a, and, and I look at this picture, my dad is 53 years old. I'm 22 years old. Right now, I'm 53 years old. My oldest son is 22 years old. My dad passed away from a massive heart attack. 
So that's very sobering as far as when we go through what do I truly want? What a loss we've had. You guys know two years ago, I had to leave the event early. This is my sister Nancy. So many of you have gone through this. You know it's very sobering. My dad passed away massively right away. My sister, we've walked her through a 14-month journey that was painful. And the most painful part of the process, and my sister Nancy would tell you herself, was to watch my mom have to deal with this. It has a way of maturing you and really getting down to what really matters in life. And many of you have gone through similar things. There, you know, there's nothing that brings more perspective to life than death. You know, we all know we're going to die. We just don't think we will. <laughs> and uh, I, I love this poem by Robert Downing Hamilton. And he said this, and this, you could tell he's experienced pain because he said, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow and never a word said she. But oh, the things I've learned from her when sorrow walked with me. I would just say, I've, I've learned some things along the way on what I want and what's not so important anymore. And when you are going through this process, it doesn't have to be big, it doesn't have to be more, and don't be shooting on yourself. What's, what's truly important? What aligns with your value? So I'm going to give you an example, and we're going to turn to the golden resource booklet in a second. But I'm going to just show you this resource right here. I'm going to give you an example of what I've done in setting a goal. So here, here would be my goal right here. This is one of my goals, is optimal health. Now, most people, when they say they want to get healthy, they, they, they always do weight. And I'm not trying to lose weight. I'm just trying to gain health. Massive difference between the two. I won't be, weight is a manifestation of being healthy. A losing weight is. So... Optimal. Now, you might look at that and go, Where's the, is that specific enough? Well, you have the main direction you want to go in, and then what I have is little target mini goals. I want my blood pressure to be 115 over 75. I want my pH level, you know, the, the alkaline acid, I want that to be at 7.25. Uh, cholesterol level to be below 200. The resting heart rate, 65. Um, and then uh, exercising, I want to do that four, day, four days out of the week. My triglyceride levels, I want to get that below 150. And then my AC, the A1C reading, which is a reading that lets you know if you're on track to get diabetes or not, I, I want that to be, you know, four point, between four and five. Now, that, those are the, my target goals. I got my optimal health because I know many times people go, well, I'm kind of more seasoned in life. I don't exactly know what I want. Does that ever happen to you? You don't know what you want? Well, even if you don't know what you want, you know the direction you want to go in. If I exercise four days out of the week, I know it's, I'm going in that direction. If I have my blood pressure down, I know it's in that direction. And I have a list of these little mini goals that will take me closer. Are you with me on this, yes or no? I did one for health. I, I have another example for you. Is like just say if you're here and you want more financial security. All right, financial security is where you want to go. That's the direction. Here are the mini goals that will take you closer to where you want to go. Maxing out on your retirement account. Uh, auto saving $1,500 a month. Paying off uh, $500 worth of credit card debt a month. Uh, build up cash reserves to $60,000. Increase income by $45,000. Uh, build up your passive income level to $5,000 a month. And then have one place where you have all your financial information. Now, I just know this. Now, this is an example for you. You can put your own down. But I just know this. If you accomplish six of those seven little target goals, you'll be going in the right direction. What, what if you had a business goal? What if you had a business goal to generate $250,000 net a year? It would look something like this. You, you might do this. I want a detailed P&L that's accurate. I want to increase my database by 20%. I want to raise my percentage of referrals by 75%. I want to generate five listings a month and seven transactions each and every month. Get the listings at 65% to 35% buyers. 
and I want to do lead generation, I want to win the year. You know, win the day, win the month, win the year. Then win the year. I, I'm just telling you, if you do that, your little mini goals, you're moving in that direction. Do you agree with me, yes or no? So here's what I want you to do. Pull out your golden resource. Turn to number one, identify. And I want you to identify your overall goal at the, on the top and then the little mini goals or little target goals that will take you in that direction. You can write that down as well. All right, next, we're going to talk number two is you got to connect and embed. This is so important. You can write a goal, but if you do not connect and embed, what happens? It, it just becomes an empty paper bag because it's something that you did at an event that was in a controlled environment, but you didn't connect it to who you are and what you're all about, and you get on the cycle of up and down. So I'm going to give you the trifecta, three elements to help you redeem that goal right there. Are you ready for them? You've heard me talk about them before. I'm going to talk about it again. It's all about, it's about your head, your heart, and your hands. Head, heart, hands. You go back to your workbook. Go back to your workbook. Why is it important to get it ingrained and embedded in your head, heart, hands? Because your head gives you focus. Your heart is where your beliefs come in. And then your hands are for action. It's the alignment of all three, head, heart, hands. So many people go, well, that's what I want to do, and maybe there's a little bit of focus, but you don't believe it in your heart. Some people go, I, I think I really want this. I believe it. Oh, I do, but they don't take action. All three, head, heart, hands. And I'm going to give you a little bit. If you turn to your, your golden resource, turn to your golden resource. I want you to write these thoughts down, and I want you to refer to them on a regular basis. Because we hear about focus all the time. Brian talked about Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. What was the one quality uh, that made them successful? You remember Brian talking about this? And what was it? Focus. I want to give you a tip that Steve Jobs gave everyone about how to get more focus. It's pretty simple. Focus is about saying no. You can write that down. Write it right in your golden resource. Right next to head. Write, focus is about saying no. You got to get good at saying no. And I'm not saying say no to only people. I'm selling real estate. I'm focused. I'm in my, going into my office. Sometimes it's saying no to drama. Sometimes it's saying no to negativity. Sometimes it's saying no to gossip. Sometimes it's saying no to social media. Sometimes it's saying no to sleeping in late. It's no, 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 this is what I'm going to do. Get good at saying no. Can I hear you say no? no. Okay, I won't ask you again. <laughs> All right, next, head, get good at saying no. Number two is heart. You'll hear people say, I believe in all my heart. Have you heard people say that? Yeah, because that's where, in my opinion, where your, your beliefs come in. Uh, uh, you can write this down. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. And Brian often will refer to me, and he'll say, you know, the book that Joe Nego really got him going, and there's no doubt about it, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I told Brian about it. I've read it a number of times. I've listened to the tapes. But the one book that has had the major impact on me was the book called As a Man Thinketh. Have you read it? Okay, you want to get the, um, the quote? All right, you can br bring it back. It's, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. You can bring that case, bring it back case to um, the, the, the fill in the blank for heart. All right, did you get it? All right, we're going to, did you get it? Okay, great. So, as a man thinketh. So, this book right here, it's only 21 pages. I I'll tell you, the, one of the most impactful little poems I've ever read is when I first got into real estate, someone gave me this book, and I read this little, uh, this little poem right in the beginning of the book. And it goes like this. You can bring it up, Case. And it talks about thought in, the ma in your mind. It says, mind is the master power that molds and makes, and manned is mind and evermore he takes. The tool of thought and shaping what he wills brings forth a thousand joys, a thousand ills. Now watch this. 
He thinks in secret, and it comes to pass. Environment is but a looking glass. I love that phrase, the looking glass. It's a mirror. My grandmother used to use that term, the looking glass. It's actually a mirror. It's how you think is what you see. You know, you're in the real estate business, the market's bad, well, you're going to see the market bad. Market's good, you'll see the market's good. You work with a buyer, you expect him to buy, he will buy, she will buy. It's your environment, it's just your looking glass. When it comes to your goal, if you believe in your heart that you are going to achieve that goal, it will be achieved. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he. And then with the hands, it's all about action. And we know the greatest tool to get someone to take action is this greatest sequence ever taught on the face of the earth is the Nike Joe Moss sequence. Are you guys familiar with the Nike Joe Moss sequence, yes or no? Let's say it together. Just, just do it. Just, all right, let's just do it like you mean it. You're going to redeem your golden ticket and you want to just do it, just do it now, just do it again. Because there's going to be some habits and some skills that need to get developed in order to achieve that goal. So it's just do it, just do it now, just do it again. Let's say it one more time. Do it. Just do it again. So when you're going through a lull, you're going one of those, one of through those valleys, and you have to make more calls, or you have to get up early, or you have to exercise. Just tell yourself, just do it, just do it now, just do it again. Because if you have it in your head and in your heart and in your hands, and those three are aligned, now you are embedded and connected to your goal. Without having that in place, it's an empty paper bag. I mean, Jim Rohn said this about goals. He said, there's no telling what you can do when you get inspired. There's no telling what you can do when you believe in them. There's no telling what will happen when you act upon them. You know what Jim is saying? It's all about your head, heart, hands. You guys got that? Step number three. Here's the phase number three. This is a big one. This is, this is big. Because I think most people set a goal. They do get it in their heart head and hands, but they struggle with establishing a plan of attack. It's hard to set a plan of attack. George Patton once said, a, a good plan violently executed today is better than the perfect plan executed next week. What do we all try to do? We set a goal. We know we should do it. We want to make it perfect. Have you ever fought, fallen prey to that? Yeah, it's like, oh, i got to be proud. What if I, what if, then that, and then should I, should I, should I? <laughs> because setting a plan requires us to think. And, and I'll tell you, there is one area that I've really grown in over the last eight years is really planning. Because I've really learned how to slow down and really think. I don't, I don't take my thinking for granted. Really taking my time and thinking, and I'm going to show you how I've gone about doing it. Uh, Dr. Seuss even saw the power in thinking. He said, think left, think right, think low, think high. Oh, the thinks we can think if we only... Easier said than done. I I'm going to give you three elements to setting up a plan of attack. You're going to fill these in in your workbook. Number one, and I've talked about this before, I'm going to go deeper with this, is one is you have to mind dump. Number two is really learning how to make advanced decisions. Mind dump, advanced decisions. And then number three is allowing the plan to develop and take shape. Allowing the plan to develop and take, take shape. So it's mind dumping, make advanced decisions, and then allow the plan to develop and take shape. You've got to be patient. You've got to allow it. You can't, you can't stop until it gets going. Now, you can write these three words down. This is how you plan. Number one is you've got to empty your mind, which is mind dumping. You're emptying your mind. And we're going to do that here in a second. But you're just taking an 
empty sheet of paper and you're emptying your thoughts. Have you ever felt overwhelmed or you have so much on your mind you wind up doing nothing? That's because you, you're, full, you're, you're on tilt. You have too much in your head. You've got to get it emptied onto a piece of paper so you can see what you're thinking. So you can see what you're thinking. Have you ever done something where you go, I don't know what I was thinking? <laughs> has, has your spouse ever done something where you go, what was she thinking? What's he thinking? Well, well you, you don't know because you couldn't see it. If you could see it, you'd do something different. The next is decide. You got to decide. You got to empty. You got to see what you have in your mind, your thoughts, ideas, and how it pertains to your goal. Goal, and then you got to decide. I'll show you some decisions I made in advance after a mind dumping episode, and then you got to allow it to take shape. This is a process. It's not one time. Oh, I've set my goal. I don't understand why it's not happening. Oh, I got a coach. I set a goal. Well. There's a process to it that you need to be fully engaged in. So you've got to empty your mind, see what you're thinking, decide on your thoughts, allow the plan to take shape. Now, this is a reenactment of my health goal. All right, here's a reenactment of some mind dumping and some decisions I made. It's this right here. All right, so here's what I did. I took the pencil. Again, this is a reenactment, and I just mind dumped a bunch of thoughts that were in my mind. I was looking at, you could pull up the first quadrant. I, I know health. I wanted to exercise four days out of the week. And I had to ask myself, what exactly am I going to do? I wasn't going to leave it until Monday morning at 8 a.m. to decide what, what type of workout I'm going to do. So I looked and I, I looked at, is, am I going to lift weights, do kettlebells? Am I going to run, yoga? You know, what am I going to do to build muscle? And I made some decisions. I, I'm going to start doing kettlebells. I'll start doing yoga with Julie. I'm going to try to set that up four days out of the week. So I didn't know initially. I dumped it. I was able to see it. I made some decisions. Uh, next, Here, here's another section is uh, how was I going to determine my health? Most people use a scale. I, I think that's, that's a lower level. Uh, it's good feedback, but it's a lower level feedback mechanism. What, what's my blood pressure going to be? What's my resting heart rate rate? How about my cholesterol level? I, I just dumped that stuff down so I could see what I was thinking. Next, I had um, uh, habits. You know, on the road, John Gordon talked about it earlier, how it, it is hard to be on the road. And Brian will tell you, you know, your, your adrenaline levels are high, low, you're eating in all different places, sleeping in different beds. It's, it's hard. So I had to decide. And when I get in town, I find the locus, local Whole Foods, and I'll go to visit Whole Foods and try to eat as healthy as I possibly can. I want to cut back on sugar. Then next is I had other things like I had the Vitamix machine, I had a juicer, I wanted to get a nutritionist. Now that was a thought I had, but until I wrote it down, it never became a serious element of my goal. So I wrote that down, a nutritionist. I found a woman who was a, a health scientist, worked for Kellogg's. She knew all about food. She's awesome. I had a Dr. Tam as a guy is doing some work with. Do you see how that works? I just dumped all my thoughts. And then I started making some decisions. I started doing things like my mother said I need to take turmeric. So I took turmeric to thin the blood. So my mom's like, you got to take turmeric. I take aloe vera every morning, just a little shot to get my alkaline levels up. Uh, you see the Vitamix, does that look familiar? There's my recipe right there. Uh, that Vitamix is 23 years old. You know where I got the Vitamix from? I got it as a wedding gift. You know who gave it to me? Brian and Beverly. There's Brian. He's on the right there. <laughs> this is interesting. Not many people know this, but that was back in 95. Julie and I got married. We invited uh, Brian Bev, the, his family was Anna, and um, his kids came in as well, and they stayed at our home. So I always tell everyone, the first day of my honeymoon I spent with Brian. <laughs> now, the first day, it wasn't the first night, just the first day. But he was in and he got the Vitamix, and that becomes part of my plan. I also do juicing. So I'll juice two, two times out of the month. Why two times? I don't know. That's what I decided I wanted to do. 
and I put that little brick in place as I build out my plan. Um, another thing as far as being more active, I wanted to, I didn't want to sit around and be on the couch late at night. That's kind of a problem time for me. So what I did is I wound up buying a bike. I bought a Towny Electra. And it's, it's an awesome bike. It's oversized. It's almost like riding a horse. It's a beach cruiser. You see the basket in the back? I ride through the neighborhood. Everyone thinks I'm working for Uber Eats. <laughs> but you see, uh, you see how that works? It's just, just dumping the thoughts, then deciding, allowing the plan to unfold. You want to plan for your life. You know, wh wh what is it I need to do? You're taking your time, writing it down, so you see in your thoughts, making some decisions one at a time, and then allowing your plan to take shape. You're not going to do it all at once. It'll be a process. So you think about this. You clearly identify a goal that aligns with who you are. You connect it to your head, heart, hands. And then you have a plan of attack. You're on your way. And now you have to take the next step. If I told you I could give you advice that would make you smarter than you already are, make you stronger both physically and mentally, would you put that advice into action, yes or no? Step number four is you got to be bold. You got to be bold. You got to be bold. You know why? Boldness, boldness has power, has genius, power, and magic in it. it says Johann Wolfgang Van Gogh. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Now, when I talk about boldness, I'm not talking about being rude. I'm not talking about being overbearing. I'm not talking about being ignorant. I'm just talking about making a decision and going for it. Now, people go, how many of you would like to be more bold? Can I just see a show of hands? Now, how many of you are sitting next to someone that needs to be a whole lot more bold? Yeah, okay, gotcha. Here's my advice. If you want to be more bold, here's what you need to do. Number one is you got to take more calculated risks. Take a calculated risk. You know what you want to do. You know what you should be doing. You have this thought rotisserizing on your, in your mind, but you haven't pulled the trigger on that. You haven't made a decision on it yet. You haven't been bold to do it. So you take a calculated risk. Number one, exude confidence when you do it. This is what I want. This is what I'm doing. Next is you got to exercise courage. Because maybe achieving your goal has nothing to do with know-how, and it has more to do with character. Your courage to be bold, to go for it. And, I, and just make a decision that it would make you feel a little uncomfortable. I had a situation not too long ago. I had been on the road doing a bunch of training events. I hadn't been eating as well as I had liked. I was not sleeping well. And it was just kind of, and, and my comfort food is soda. Soda and pizza. Now, I grew up on the south side of, in Chicago, the Midwest, in, in, we call it pop. Right, you get pop. You know, we I, I drink pop with uh, popcorn and pizza, pretzels and pizza, right? Uh, hamburgers and pizza is pop with everything. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's often family fights that take place when someone else comes into the house and we're a Pepsi house, and you come in and you drink Coca Cola. That's a problem. That is a problem. So that that's how connected and emotionally connected I am to soda, and. Uh, I was out, Julie and I were out in, uh, in Worcester, Massachusetts, visiting my son Connor at Holy Cross College. There we are right there. And I had just come off the road, and I was tired, and I said, well, let's, let's go get something to eat. So we wind up going to get something to eat. We wind up going to go, go into a local Chipotle. And I love Chipotle because they have unlimited amount of refills on their soda. <laughs> and we go there, and I'm drinking the soda, and I have another one. And I had three. And I turned to Julie and I said, this has got to stop. I, I can't keep on doing this because it tastes good going down but feels bad afterwards. And my son Connor turns to me and he said, why don't you just stop drinking pop? And I said, you know what? I've been giving you a whole bunch of advice in your lifetime and you've taken some of it. But I said, you're giving me some advice right now. I'm taking your advice. 
And I grabbed the soda. I said, look at this. This will be the very last soda I ever drink in my entire life. And I took the soda and I tossed it away. Now, that, that was a bold decision to get me to where I want to go, get me closer to my health goal. It doesn't always have to be that way. You could be in business. Uh, you guys know I've been, I was at a real estate office. I had 30, 36 other agents. Uh, I was doing more production than the other 35 combined. And all these leads coming in, they were all coming to me because I was out there doing the calls, notes, pop. I had the database. I was working the marketplace. And the owner of the company made a policy decision when it came to incoming leads. And they say, you don't generate your own leads. You're part of a team. They go to the entire office. So all my referrals, all my leads coming in started to get dispersed because the other agents were upset that I was just dominating the market. They should be upset, but they should take it a different way. So I told the broker I, wasn't, I didn't agree with that. I had 55 active listings at that time. I had 45 deal pending listings, over, over $200,000 in commissions, which was a whole lot of money back uh, 20 years ago. Uh, it's even a lot now, but I had all that, and I was anchored there, and, I, and my sister, Terry, who works with me, go, what are we going to do? She's crying, oh, we got all our money, we can't leave it, and it's like, time out. We just opened up our own company, Nego Real Estate. So if you go to Nego Real Estate today, and you look at the upper right-hand corner, there was a bold decision made on that day, September 27, 1994, at 4.10 p.m., Sometimes you got to just make a decision. Not too long ago, you know, Brian had gone to, uh, you know, I know John was talking about Normandy. Julie's dad, who just recently passed, actually was involved in the Normandy invasion. And I told Julie, it's like, I, I, I got done playing basketball. I worked in real estate. Uh, and then we had kids, and it's like, I love to travel. I never really got a chance to travel. And now the kids are getting older, and it's like, I would love, and Brian was telling me how he went to London and went to Paris and how he went to Normandy. He's like, oh, you got to go. And for a number of years, I've always tried to look for the right time. I'm like, Let, let's go now. Oh, we can't because this guy's in school and this guy's taking summer school classes and this guy's in play. It, there's never a perfect time. Have you figured that out yet? I wake up one morning. Julie and the boys are there. And I say, I have an announcement to make. I said, I'm going to London. I'm going to Paris, and I'm going to Normandy. Who's coming with? And uh, Julie like, but we got this. And I said, I just, honey, if with your blessing, I'm going. Who's coming with? And two of the boys go, we'll go. So I go, all right, I gave my credit card. Book the tickets right now. What dates? I don't know. Give me a calendar. We'll figure out. I just make a bold decision, and I did. And here's what happened. We all go there. We had the time of our lives. We had the time of our lives. The boys came back. They told Julie and their brothers about it. It was awesome. It was awesome. You know, there's, it was, we talk, still talk about it today. A bold decision got me to go, reach a goal. Uh, just recently, I told them again. I go, woke up, and I just had this feeling. I go, I'm going to Italy. Who's going with? <laughs> and they go, we'll all go. Now, here's a little advice. Make sure you check your budget before you make proposals like that. But what bold decision do you need to make? What, what bold decision do you keep on rotisserizing in on your mind that you know will take you closer to your goal, but you just haven't done it? You haven't had the courage, you haven't had the confidence. It, whatever it is, what is it? I want you to make a decision today or make a decision sometime in the future. So you, you got to be bold when you're pursuing what your goal is and what you truly want. Uh, and, I, and I love this quote right here. Maybe we could say it together. Out with the old in with the bold. Out with the old, in with the bold. Here's phase number five. Here's phase number five. And this is big. You have to clear out room to work on achieving your goal. You got to clear out, clear out room to work. Without clearing out room to work, what happens? It's like you're here, you're undistracted, you're focused, and it's like, this is what I'm going to do. I, I'm going to Normandy. And you have that in your plan, and then you get back and it never happens. Because when you get back home, the music isn't soft anymore, and the people aren't as supportive, and then you're kind of 
pinned in, and then the goal you've written that seemed like a good idea here is not such a good idea there because you don't have time to execute on it. I'm telling you this, you have to clear out room to work. You have to clear out room to work. Michael Jordan, who, in my opinion, is the greatest athlete that ever lived, and he had a principle that he used about clearing out people out of their way. And you'll hear this. Have you ever heard the expression, oh, he's the Michael Jordan of? You have, I always tell Brian, you're the Michael Jordan of, of sales training and speaking. You are the Michael Jordan of. That means you're the best at what you do. The Wall Street Journal recently did an article on all the references to Michael Jordan of. And it's, it's crazy because here's a guy named Kurt Gutman. Kurt Gutman said, my grandmother is the Michael Jordan of gin rummy. Who knew? Uh, there's, in the San Francisco Examiner, they called, they called um, Al Frazier the Michael Jordan of Scottish fiddling. Brian uh, Capoletto, did you know that he was the Michael Jordan of Scrabble? And this is my favorite right here, Melvin Luntz. He was the Michael Jordan of wood chopping. What? <laughs> when someone says you're the Michael Jordan of, that means you're the best at what you do. There's a standard of excellence. And I've watched Michael Jordan up close, personal, his whole career. And here's what he would do. He would use the clear-out principle. He would dribble the ball down the floor. And when the game was on the line, he would clear people out of his way. His teammates and the defenders, get out of my way. Give me room to work. He'd get them out of the way. And he'd go to work. And he would score. You'd get them out of the way. See, was that a successful principle, yes or no? Yeah, I mean, it's worked for him. Uh, you could see the, the gold rings if you're into jewelry. But I'm telling you this, the most successful people on this planet use the clear-out principle every day. And if you want to achieve your goal and prevent it from being an empty paper bag, you want to redeem that golden ticket, you have to clear out room to work. And this is a more extensive exercise that you'll do in your small group. But let me share with you how you use the clear out principle. Number one, you got to eliminate obstacles. You got to eliminate those obstacles. You know what they are, eliminate them. Number two, you got to anticipate situational challenges. There, there's challenges along the way to your goal. You want to be more financially secure. You, you know what the issues are, and I'll cover some of them for you. And then you got to make the required sacrifices. you got to make the required sacrifices. So I'm, I'm going to show you an example of this, and I'm going to let you work on it a little bit. But if you look in your golden resource booklet, you're going to see three columns. The first columns are is what obstacles need to be cleared out of your way, what situational challenges need to be anticipated, what sacrifices are required? Now, this is a deeper level exercise. I just want to get you going and show you how it works. You can extend it more in your small group, but I'll tell you this. If you do not do this, you will have an empty paper bag experience. Just because you set the goal, you identified it, you embedded it, you, you don't get to this stage, it's empty. Because the obstacles out in your real life are too much. you got to plan for it. So, for example, if you had a financial goal, one of the obstacles you might have to overcome would be spontaneous spending, consumer debt, and then maybe even the, the debt-free, in-debt cycle. I'm out of debt, I'm in debt. I'm out of debt, I'm in debt. That, that cycle needs to stop. Like if you want to get for financial security, that's an obstacle. Th those are examples of what you could do. Uh, what situational challenges need to be anticipated? Social shopping, um, big ticket purchases, or maybe the obligatory gift holidays. You know, Christmas, birthdays, anniversaries. Uh, you don't know what you want to get someone, so you get them a big expensive gift to make up for not planning. My mother has 43 grandchildren. 43 grandchildren. That would drive any grandmother broke. But my, grand, my mom is very regimented. 
It's like, for your birthday, you get $25. If you graduate from school, you get $50. And she kind of regimented all that because she's on a budget. That's an example of someone being financially secure on how they can plan for those situational challenges. What sacrifices need to be made? You know, stick to a budget, eat at home one extra time a week, reduce debt while saving at the same time. So you got to clear out, clear out. I had, uh, you know, John and Brian, they were talking earlier about how you have to kind of take care of yourself in order to take care of other people. And many of us, we all have like servants' hearts, don't we? Like you, you want to do good for people, you want to go the extra mile, and sometimes the, the, the servanthood mindset that we have or the spirit we have can work against us sometimes. And even in my own home, you know, we all would do anything for our kids or for your, your spouse or your significant other. You'd do anything for them. And, but then sometimes when we set a goal or I set a goal, sometimes it requires the rest of the family to support what I'm trying to do. And just recently I had told the kids and I told Julie, you know, having five boys, how many of you have boys? You have any of you have boys? All right, I got five of them. It, they're eating all the time. It's like a swarm of locusts coming through the house. If it's not moving, they're going to eat it. That's why we got to watch the dog. They, they, the dog is off limits, right? It's like I'm going to buy a farm and put them out the pasture. They're eating all the time. And I'm trying to eat better. I want to eat healthy. So Julie told the boys, is like, we got a little corner of the refrigerator for dad. And don't touch any of dad's food in the corner. So I have, here it is. I got the pasture-free ra- or raised chicken eggs. I have the guacamole, I have some drinks there, I got blueberries and raspberries, and uh, so that's my little section of the refrigerator. I, I'm not asking too much, and it's hard because the guys go, I, I want them to have what, let me know what you want, I'll run to the store and get it for you, but please just don't, don't touch my food, please. That's all I ask. And here they are right here. This is the crew right here. Uh, these guys, I'll do anything for them. I've, I've, done, I've done a lot. This little guy in the red shirt. He's a guy I had an issue with just recently. He comes into the kitchen and he's eating some potato chips and then he works on some pretzels and then he goes over and has a, has a snicker bar and he's still hungry. He opens up the refrigerator and what do you think he starts eyeing up? My blueberries. No, don't mess with my blueberries. It was in the middle of January in Chicago they were organically grown blueberries, which cost me about 75 bucks a pint. <laughs> and I see this guy reach up, and I'm standing behind him. I could see what he's thinking. And I see him working his way. He's looking around. He goes, oh, the blueberries. And he reaches up for the blueberries. And I had to protect my goal. <laughs> I had to clear out. And I told him, I said, do not touch my blueberries. Do not touch my blueberries. That's all I ask. Can I just have my blueberries? <laughs> because sometimes you set a goal and you have something that's extremely important to you. And there's family or a spouse or kids that they're just, I, I don't want to say they get in the way. Let's just say they're not as supportive as they should be. And you set your plan and sometimes me protecting my blueberries was a good thing for him because I'm trying to stick to a plan. I'm trying to eat right. And what I needed to do is clear out. I needed to clear out this all sacrificing for the kids. And for once, I needed to take care of myself. Clear out. I'm going to clear out the negative thinking, clear out the drama, clear out the excuses. I'll clear it out because when you use the clear out principle and you focus on what you need to get done, you're in a position where this goal writing session is not an empty paper bag experience. Are you with me on that? I love this quote by Frank Clark. He said, uh, if you can find a path with no obstacles, it probably doesn't lead anywhere. (laughs) So you got to clear out. There's going to be obstacles along the way. Number six, number six is set up feedback mechanisms. Feedback mechanisms are real important. They need to be daily Without a feedback mechanism, what happens is it's an empty paper bag experience. It's, it's something that you're hoping for, 
but doesn't come to fruition. And what happens is no feedback, you get off path. And I believe as human beings, we're created with feedback. I mean, God created us with five senses, sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste. We're constantly receptors of feedback. We use feedback on everything. You need to have feedback in order to redeem your golden ticket. How many of you enjoy barbecuing? Yeah, I, I, I do too, but I'm just not good at it. And until recently, I, you know, the boys, one of the things they, they like to eat, so Julie and I will get all five of the boys together, we'll have a nice meal, I'll barbecue, and I go to Whole Foods, I get grass-fed beef, and I'll put the, get the nicest cut of, of steak I can find, and what happens is time and time again, I either overcook it or undercook it. I, I don't know. It looks, sometimes the feedback on the eyes is deceiving, and I've it, you know, sometimes it's gamey, it's not cooked enough, and it's just not good. Julie picks up on this, and she winds up buying me a meat thermometer. Have you ever seen the, the eye grill meat thermometer? Have you ever seen this? Okay, a phenomenal Father's Day gift or Mother's Day gift. Uh, but this meat thermometer right here, the, um, the thermometer gets injected into the middle of the meat. It, there's a cord to it, and it goes to a transponder, that goes through Bluetooth to my phone. And it's taken the temperature inside the meat. So when I know, I like my steak medium rare, when I know it's at 140, I know it's time to pull the steak off the grill. My boy's the same way. How would you like your steak cooked? And they'll roll their eyes. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> no, what, how do you like it cooked? And I get the temperature because I can get feedback. I got feedback. And now it helps me. Now the, the steaks look much better. Um, there's usually, uh, yeah, that usually disappears real quick. <laughs> but he, here's the thought. Many times writing your goal without feedback d doesn't keep you on the right path, doesn't keep you going to where you want to go. So here it is. Step number six, you got to do this. You got to have consistent input. You got to have accurate information. And it needs to come from objective sources, and if you can write this on the bottom, it should come in daily. You got to have daily feedback. And, and I'll give you a couple examples of this in regards to optimal health. I, I want feedback to keep me on track. So what do I do? I use, I don't use the scale, I use my, I'll do like blood test. So I went to the doctor, got some blood tests done. I have a blood pressure gauge. I take my blood pressure twice a month. It's just a form of feedback. Uh, I'll also use a, a Fitbit. You guys use Fitbits? Uh, it's a great form of feedback. You ever have a day where you're, you're, you think you're active, but you look at your Fitbit, and it was objective? You, you, you're not moving as much as you need to move, right? See, w without having that feedback, you don't get to where you want to go. Now, I'm going to show you another, the most powerful form of feedback I use when it comes to exercising and health is my calendar. So this is an example of my calendar. I put a little W. You see all the W's? Now you're probably thinking, am I a Cubs fan? And those were the days that they beat the Giants and the Dodgers going to the World Series. But no, it's just the days I worked out. And I just go, I want to work out four days out of the week. I want to mark it on my calendar. I got that day and I won this day and I won this day. And I track it. It's an objective form of feedback. But you could do that with your personal finances. Your personal finances, you could use your net worth, mint.com, bank alerts. Like getting your finances in order and on track is very, very easy. There's a whole bunch of feedback mechanisms out there. In your business, you can use a balance sheet. You could use a company budget or a coach. What is a coach? It's just another form of feedback with a little bit more intensity, right, to keep you on track. You look at referral maker CRM. Here's all the charts and the graphs. Brian and I and the team, we put all this together, giving you a bunch of feedback to get you where you want to go. So what is your goal? What feedback do you have in place? I, I, I love this quote. real very brilliant man once said, there's no such thing as failure. There's only... Yeah. All right, here's step number seven is you got to trust the process. you got to trust the process. What does the word trust mean? It means... A, an, an assured reliance on the character, ability, and truth of someone or something. 
you got you to trust. It's an assured reliance. You put your goal in place. You, put, you, you identify what you want. You connect. You get a plan of attack. You're, you're bold in your decisions. You clear out. You get forms of feedback. Your goal is in the bag. It is in the bag. There is no doubt about it if you're serious about it. It is in the bag. You've got to trust that that will happen. You've got to trust the process, which is a natural phenomenon marked by gradual changes that lead to a desired result. It's natural. It's going to be gradual changes that get you to the result. It's not, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. And I know what happens. I, I know what happens. You're going to start the process, and you're going to go, I, I know what I want. I'm going to connect it. I'm going to believe. I really want this. Take action. Here's my plan of attack. You start going down this path, and then there's a setback. And what do most people do? Get discouraged and quit. Here's what I want you to do. As opposed to using the word quit or stop, you need to reset you need to reset, which means to set again or anew. It needs to set again or, or anew. You set, I didn't, I'm not quitting. I'm just going to reset. I, even my own health goals. I, I, I'm like down the path. I'm like I'm, I'm eating right. I'm exercising. I'm moving forward. And then sometimes I go backwards. Has that ever happened to you? You take three, four steps forward and then two steps back. You experience that? You're not failing. You're just doing the cha-cha. You know, one of those deals. I think that's hilarious. That, uh, oh, my goodness. But anyway, but you, you're just doing the cha-cha. Three steps up, two steps back. Four steps up, one step back. Six steps up, three steps back. You're still making progress. You didn't quit. You don't have to start over. Just reset. Get refocused. Keep moving forward. Uh, you guys know my oldest son, Harrison. He's 22 years no, old now. He actually goes to Hillsdale College. And I love the school's motto. And I want to ask you, what do you think this motto is? And the motto goes like this, strength, what's in a challenge? What would you, what would you put in there? Lies in the challenge? Lives in the challenge? Someone says grows in the challenge? Here it is right here. Here it is. Strength rejoices in the challenge. Strength rejoices in the challenge. So every time you have a challenge, you know, you know my, my son Harrison, he'll be getting out of school soon. He'll be uh, looking for an internship or job. He started looking for an internship this uh, summer. I, I did very little to oh, be an overbearing parent to set him up. I just let, let him, you know, part of your education is trying to find it. I'll give you, you can call people, you could talk with people, but I'm not going to set up a job for you. And he didn't want me to either. He's like, I got this. I got this. And, I, and he'll tell me, strength rejoices in the challenge. <laughs> you keep on going, son. So we, we covered seven phases of redeeming your golden ticket. There, there's different phases. This is different than anything you've ever experienced before. Because in the past, we played soft music. You'd write your goal, and my hat is off to Brian. He's put more people through that process. It's wonderful. And we haven't had many venues or opportunity to talk about the process of clearly identifying what you want and moving forward. You think about Charlie. Charlie Bucket. Did he use the seven phases of redeeming his golden ticket, yes or no? Yeah, he clearly identified what he wanted. He connected. He's like, I have as good a chance as anyone. In his head, heart, hands, he took action. He had a plan of attack. He was bold in his approach. He cleared out. Then he got feedback, and he trusted the process. He even trusted himself. When he gave back the gobstopper, here's, here's my advice to you. What are you going to do with your goal? And again, maybe even if you didn't write a goal that you're excited about, this is a process. You write a goal and you're excited about it, 
you clearly identify what you wanted? Does it align with who you are? Did you connect and embed it in your head, heart, hands? Have a plan of attack by mind dumping? Did, are you going to make a bold? How many of you made a bold decision? Great. Congratulations. You clear out room to work. You get the feedback. You trust the process. Good things will happen. Wow, it's such great content. We hope you enjoyed this episode full of valuable tools and that you'll put these seven steps of writing goals into action. If you do, we're confident you'll have a higher success rate of achieving them. If you've never been to one of our events, visit BethaniaCompany.com and check out the schedule. Brian and our speakers are even better in person than they are on the podcast. So we'll leave you today with Brian's mum, Therese, giving you an Irish blessing to brighten your week. We'll see you next time. May the road rise up to meet you, and may the wind always be at your back. May the rain fall soft upon your fields and the sun shine warm upon your face. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. See you next time. Bannock Day or if glare.